Um, hello everyone, it's been a while since I've done any learning streams like this. Uh, so I'm super, super, super excited to do this. Uh, there was one thing that I did realize uh, this morning, uh, thinking about it, and so I think today I will reach out to, uh, what's his name? It, it's um, Robert Nystrom. Um, uh, probably on, on Twitter, I'll just uh, let him know that I am doing this and uh, and if if I can, you know, make sure I get his full permission. We'll go through the uh, the introduction today and like maybe the first parts of the first one because that's what I can get in the demo on um, on Amazon. Now, uh, the reason why I think this is going to be okay is while we can purchase this book, uh, there is a completely free version um, uh, available for everyone. So, we can go and we can get the web, uh, the web version of the book, but we can also pay for it uh, if if we want. Um, that also includes a physical book, so that's pretty awesome. All right, so uh, an introdu introduction to why I'm doing this. In a previous stream, I created a uh, Infinite Runner game uh, using p5.js, and the plan is I want to learn game programming patterns. Uh, and I'm going to use that simple game uh, to sort of improve it, apply these patterns to the game. Uh, I also want to, as soon as I get a uh, my desktop, which supposedly shipped yesterday, so I'm looking forward to that, uh, as soon as I get a new desktop for streaming, I'll be able to do Rust again, and I will apply um, what we learn here to both uh, JavaScript and P5.js, and then take that to Rust. Um, so that way we can follow closely with object-oriented programming and then take the, the essence of what we learn and apply it to uh, whatever style of programming we have with Rust. It's not truly functional. It's not like, um, it, it's not object-oriented. It's not procedural. Uh, it's almost its own thing, or maybe I just don't know the right word for it. Uh, regardless, I wanted to uh, to jump into it. So if we go down to the web, um, and do we go into? Uh, do we want? I'm thinking of. Uh, uh, let's see. I don't know if I want to go through the introduction for this. Uh, maybe yeah. Let's just do the introduction. Um, all right. So. Uh, in fifth grade, my friends and I were given access to a little unused classroom housing, a couple of very, uh, oh, uh, in a little unused classroom housing, a couple of very beat up TRS 80s. Hoping to inspire us, a teacher found a printout of some simple basic programs for us to tinker with. The audio cassette drives in the computers are broken, so anytime we wanted to run some code, we'd have to carefully type it in from scratch. This led us to prefer programs that were only a few lines long, like print Bobby is radical and go to 10. Um, I do actually remember uh, basic on my first PC that I had too. And I don't, I don't know if I ever like even got this far with it. I, I, I sort of like played around with it a little bit, but only from like the books that had the stuff to like write in. Um, <laughs> And then sidebar, maybe if the computer prints it enough times, it will magically become true. Even so, the process was, was fraught with peril. Uh, we didn't know how to program, so a tiny syntax error was impenetrable to us. If the program didn't work, which was often, we started over from the beginning. At the back of the stack of pages was a real monster, a program that took up several dense pages of code. It took a while before we worked up the courage to even try it, but it was irresistible. The title above the listing was Tunnels and Trolls. We had no idea what it did, but it sounded like a game. And what could be cooler than a computer game that you programmed yourself? We never did get it running, and after a year, we moved out of that classroom. Much later, when I actually knew a bit of basic, I realized that it was just a character generator for the tabletop game, and not a game in itself. But the die was cast. That's a, that's a good pun for that. Um, from there on out, I wanted to be a game programmer. When I was in my teens, my family got a Macintosh with, with Quick Basic 
and later. Think C. I spent almost all of my summer vacations hacking together games. Learning on my own was slow and painful. I'd, uh, I'd get something up and running easily, maybe a map screen or a little puzzle, but as the program grew, it got harder and harder. Fast forward several years, and a friend hands me a book, Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable, Object-Oriented Software. Finally, the book I've been looking for since I was a teenager. I read it cover to cover in one sitting. I still struggled with my own programs, but it was such a relief to see that other people struggled too and came up with solutions. I felt like I had uh, finally, uh, finally had a couple of tools to use instead of just my bare hands. Um, so let's see, uh, I, I love this sidebar. This was the first time we'd met and five minutes after being introduced, I sat down on his couch and spent the next few hours completely ignoring him and reading. I'd like to think my social skills have improved at least a little bit since then. Cracking open the source code was a humbling and surprising experience. There was a brilliant code and graph, uh, Actually, you know what? I skipped a paragraph. Here. In 2001, I landed my dream job, software engineering at Electronic Arts. I couldn't wait to get a look at some real games and see how the pros put them together. What was the architecture like for an enormous game like Madden Football? How did the different systems interact? How did they get a single code base to run on multiple platforms? Cracking open the source code was a humbling and surprising experience. There was brilliant code in graphics, AI, animation, and visual effects. We had people who knew how to squeeze every last cycle out of a CPU and put it to good use. Stuff I didn't even know was possible, these people did before lunch. But the architecture this brilliant code hung from was an afterthought. They were so focused on features and organization, uh, went, that organization went overlooked. Coupling was rife with modules. New features were often bolted onto the code base wherever they could be made to fit. To my disillusioned eyes, it looked like many programmers, if they ever cracked open design patterns at all, never got past singleton. Singletons are, are essentially classes that have like must be only called like instantiated once uh, they should never be instantiated multiple times but that's a problem because there's no way in the code to enforce that so you can't tell the compiler this singleton like throw an error if you instantiate multiple times and if there's multiple developers in a project uh, there's no stating that they might actually do that um, so at, at my company, that's actually something that they're working on is removing all the singletons from their, their, their code. Uh, of course, it wasn't really that bad. I'd imagined game programmers sitting in some ivory tower covered in whiteboards, calmly discussing architectural minutia for weeks on end. The reality was that the code I was looking at was written by people working to meet intense deadlines. They did the best they could, and, as I gradually realized, their best was often very good. The more time I spent working on game code, the more bits of brilliance I found hiding under the surface. Unfortunately, hiding was often a good description. There were gems buried in the code, but many people walked right over them. I watched coworkers struggle to reinvent good solutions when examples of exactly what they needed were nestled in the same code base they were standing on. That problem is what this book aims to solve. I dug up and polished the best patterns I found in games and presented them here so that we can spend our time inventing new things instead of reinventing them. Also, this is something that you know I've, I've noticed myself too, is that these design patterns, and like some of them might only be applicable in games, but they should be applicable everywhere. Whatever, whatever kind of like programming you're doing in whatever language that you're, you're programming in. What's in store? There are several dozens of game programming books out there. Why write another? Most game programming books I've seen fall into one of two categories. 
Domain-specific books. These narrowly focused books give you a deep dive on some specific aspect of game development. They'll teach you about 3D graphics, real-time rendering, physics simulation, artificial intelligence, or audio. They're, these are the areas that many game programmers specialize in as their careers progress. Whole engine books. In contrast, these try to span all the different parts of an entire game engine. They are oriented towards building a complete engine suited to some specific genre of game, usually a 3D first-person shooter. I was thinking whether or not I wanted to like potentially try one of these other books, but I realized that like if I was building my own engine, I would not actually be able to build like all the different types of games that I wanted. So uh, it would more, more just be an ex exercise in building an engine. Um, I like both these kind of books, but I think they leave some gaps. Books specific to a domain rarely tell you how that chunk of code interacts with the rest of the game. You may be a wizard at physics and rendering, but do you know how to tie them together gracefully? The second category covers that, but I often find whole engine books to be too monolithic and too genre specific. Especially with the rise of mobile and casual gaming, we're in a period where lots of different genres of games are being created. We aren't all just cloning Quake anymore. Books that walk you through a single engine aren't helpful when your game doesn't fit that mold. Instead, what I'm trying to do here is more a la carte. Each of the chapters in this book is an independent idea that you can apply to your code. This way, you can mix and match them in a way that works best for the game you want to make. Another example of this a la carte style is the widely beloved Game Programming Gems series, which I have not read or, uh, or heard of, so I might want to take a look at that later. How it relates to design patterns. Any programming book with patterns in its name clearly bears a relationship to the classic design patterns, elements of reusable object-oriented software by Eric Gamma, Richard Helm, Ralph Johnson, and John Vicetis. Probably mispronounced at least some of those. Ominously called the Gang of Four. By calling this book Game Programming Patterns, I'm not trying to imply that the Gang of Four's book is inapplicable to games. On the contrary, the Designs Patterns Revisited section of this book covers many of the patterns from design, uh, design patterns, but with an emphasis on how they can be applied to game programming. Conversely, I think this book is applicable to non-game software too. I could just as well have called this book more design patterns, but I think games make for more engaging examples. Do you really want to read yet another book about employee records and bank accounts? Uh, yeah, I, I've seen that a lot in banks are like boring, boring examples. Uh, all right, sidebar. Design Patterns itself was in turn inspired by a previous book. The idea of crafting a language uh, of patterns to describe open-ended solutions to problems comes from a pattern language by Christopher Alexander, along with Sarah Ishikawa and Murray Silverstein. Their book was about architecture, like real architecture with buildings and walls and stuff, but they hoped others would use the same structure to describe solutions in other fields. Design Patterns is the Gang of Four's attempt to do that for software. So uh, my own note, something that I think is really important note here is uh, this moves on to, to just design in general, like a design language allows us to um, to have like a common a common way of discussing with each other as developers um, so that way we can like move on to more important problems than having to like establish what we're saying uh, depo gam gupta uh, i probably horribly mispronounced your name but hello uh welcome you just dropped in um you just dropped got to know me from cj awesome CJ from uh, Coding Garden. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. Uh, let's see. Okay. That being said, while the patterns introduced here are useful in other software, I think they're particularly well suited to engineering challenges commonly encountered in games. Time and sequencing are often a core part of a game's architecture. 
things must happen in the right order and at the right time. Development cycles are highly compressed, and a number of programmers need to be able to rapidly build and iterate on a rich set of development, a different behavior without stepping on each other's toes or leaving footprints all over the code base. After all of this behavior is defined, it starts interacting. Monsters bite the hero, potions are mixed together, and bombs blast enemies and friends alike. Those interactions must happen without the code base turning into an intertwined hairball. Um, is that a 4K monitor because I have seen your laptop? Yes, this is a 4K monitor. Um, is the text big enough? And finally, performance is critical in games. Game developers are in a constant race to see who can squeeze the most out of their platform. Tricks for shaving off cycles can mean the difference between an A-rated game and millions of sales or dropped frames and angry reviewers. Yep, okay, awesome, perfect. Uh, so how to read this book? Um, let's see, I don't know if I need to go through this section. Uh, so I think basically there's, uh, for each of the patterns, it sounds like he's going to have several different sort of uh, sections to each section, if that were. So like the intent, so it provides a snapshot. So basically uh, just like an overview of what, of what the pattern is. The motivation is going to be why we need it. Um, the pattern, oh, wait, this also gives us, oh, this, okay, the motivation gives us a reason, like an actual problem that this solves, like an example problem. The pattern distills out of that example and gives us like the dry textbook version. I really, really, really like this. We're starting with the example first and then we're going into like the theory second, which all um, education, like modern education, um, uh, science indicates that uh, that's the way to learn. So I really like that. Uh, okay, so then the pattern goes through like the dry textbook sort of like theory of it. And then we have a when to use it, keep in mind for like, you know, consequences, guidelines, some other stuff. He has sample code um, for each of these. Uh, and then Design decisions. Okay, so I think this section is, is important. Patterns differ from single algorithms because they are open-ended. Each time you use a pattern, you'll likely implement it differently. The next section, design decisions, explores that space and shows you different options to consider when applying a pattern. So that tells me, like, algorithms is something that you can have, like, a snippet library. You can throw an algorithm into the snippet library and just, like, apply it in whatever language. And you might need to change it for the language, but it's pretty much gonna be the same every single time you use it. These patterns, however, uh, we can't do that because it's like, it sounds like they're not, they're not something that you just, oh, I just throw in there, copy paste, we're done. It's, it's more of, well, as he's talked about so far, it's an organizational strategy. Um, all right, so about the sample codes. So he is using C++, but not any of the modern features of C++, it looks like. Uh, so for example, um, Boolean update, so the type function and then return, uh, then the return, okay. So I have not programmed in C++ myself, uh, but it sounds like he's not going to be using any of the advanced features of C++, just sort of like the basics. So we can probably figure that out. Um, I'll be programming in JavaScript uh, and then later Rust. Where to go from here? Probably the next section. Um, uh, patterns are a constantly changing, expanding part of software development. This book continues the process started by the gang of four in documenting and sharing the software patterns they saw. And that process will continue after the ink dries in these pages. You are a core part of the process. As you develop your own patterns and refine or refute the patterns in this book, you contribute to the software community. 
If you have suggestions, corrections, or other feedback, uh, get in touch. And I 